start recording. Uh, so hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for this week's lecture and planning series presentation. Our speaker this week is Dr. Loretta Lees, Professor of Human Geography at the University of Leicester. My name is John Davis and I'm a PhD student here in Columbia's Urban Planning Program and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, so I'll start with a few uh, brief technical and logistical announcements, and then I'll turn to introducing today's speaker. Uh, so during the talk, I'd like to remind audience members to please mute their microphones. We'll be recording the lecture today, so anyone in the audience who wishes not to be recorded should plan on turning off their video input. The chat box should be used only for discussion regarding the session. If you have any technical questions that apply only to you, please feel free to message me privately or the other moderator for today's uh, session, Stefan Norgard. Uh, and finally, we encourage all of you to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. After presentation, we'll have time for a brief Q&A. We'll start the Q&A around 2 or 2.15 p.m. so that we have time for questions at the end. Uh, I'll be coordinating the Q&A today with attention to diversity and inclusion. If you already have had a chance to pose a question, please allow others to do so before asking another question. Uh, so with those logistic uh, announcements aside, I'd like to now turn to introducing today's speaker, Dr. Loretta Lees. Dr. Lees is an urban geographer who is internationally known for her research on gentrification, urban regeneration, global urbanism, urban policy, urban public space, architecture, and urban social theory. She has been identified as the 17th most referenced author in urban geography worldwide and the only woman in the top 20. She has published 13 books, has over 60 journal articles, and over 40 book chapters to her name. She is currently Professor of Human Geography at the University of Leicester and previously has was Professor of Human Geography at King's College London. Dr. Lees has lived in London for over 20 years and is a regular commentator on urban issues. Today, Dr. Lees' lecture called Gentrification and Displacement in London and Beyond will tell the story of gentrification in London, the city where the term itself was coined in 1964. Lees will start with pioneer, classic, or first wave gentrification, working through different mutations of the process over time from new build to super gentrification. She will finish a discussion of London focusing on state led gentrification and the large scale displacements it has caused and is continuing to cause. Dr. Lees will conclude by arguing that gentrification always was and is global, directing attention beyond London. So if you're ready now, Dr. Lees, um, I'll pass things over to you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, guys, and thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Um, I thought I'd talk about London because I think a lot of the stuff you do there is probably quite American focused and actually maybe even beyond the US, but perhaps less on London. So I'm going to start by introducing you to the uh, paragraph where the term gentrification was coined by a London based sociologist called Ruth Glass. She said in 1964, one by one, many of the working class quarters of London have been invaded by the middle classes, upper and lower. Shabby, modest mews and cottages, two rooms up and two down, have been taken over when their leases have expired and have become elegant, expensive residences. Larger Victorian houses, downgraded in an earlier or recent period, which were used as lodging houses or were otherwise in multiple occupation, have been upgraded once again. Once this process of gentrification, it's the first time the term's used, starts in a district, it goes on rapidly until all or most of the original working class occupiers are displaced and the social character of the district is changed. So you can see that there's still some attachment to that classic definition of gentrification. But as I'll show in this talk, obviously, the process itself has mutated over time since 1964. Now, just to kind of set it in context, so why is gentrification being seen to be so important uh, and why is it really i guess and i think it has actually dominated urban studies for the last certainly the last 20 years i think there are four key reasons firstly it posed a major challenge to the traditional anglo-american theories of residential location and structure so if you look at the diagram on the right the typical kind of chicago school uh, urban evolution model where the more money you have the further away from the central city you want to move and it kind of equates with kind of American suburbanization processes, et cetera. So obviously gentrification is the polar opposite of this. 
it's it's kind of middle class people wanting to move in the centre of the city. So they're going completely against the flow. So as you can imagine, it was a bit of a shock to all these kind of sociologists, geographers and planners who'd been developing these particular models. Second, gentrification regenerates, but it does that at the expense of lower income groups. It displaces lower income groups and it replaces them with higher income groups. So when urban regeneration is sold to us as, 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 as when, sorry, when gentrification is sold to us as urban regeneration, we need to be very cognizant of actually what it is and what its uh, impacts are and how it differs. Thirdly, gentrification certainly now is a major leading edge of contemporary metropolitan restructuring. And actually, I would argue it even goes beyond the metropolis, I think, with the kind of implosion of urban and rural, et cetera, through a kind of planetary urbanization processes, we can talk about that spatially differently. It's certainly still the leading edge of neoliberal urbanism, although, of course, there are big questions now about the post-COVID city and people leaving the city, gentrifiers in particular, particularly in the United States, actually. The other reason that I think it's continued to dominate urban studies is because there's been lots of attention to gentrification globally more recently. Of course, gentrification is now a global process, but um, in the work that I've done, we've also shown that gentrification actually has long been a global process. It didn't just suddenly go global and it wasn't simply kind of the south copying from the north or the east copying from the west. So let's zoom in then on London and I'm going to go through the kind of different waves. And I think it's probably quite interesting for most people because I think you guys probably rarely get this kind of picture of London. Um, so what I'm going to look at is Islington, which is an inner London borough that I live in, actually. And I'm looking at some of the kind of key areas of gentrification in that borough. So one of the locations I want to look at is Barnsbury, which is one of these kind of classic areas of gentrification. So if you go back to the post-war years, Barnsbury and inner London had obviously gone into decline. In fact, the entire country had gone into decline, but that's a different story. Um, its upper middle class residents had begun to move out to the suburbs um, and the kind of swathes of suburban development, suburban housing that was being built attracted them. It was relatively cheap. It was easy to get a mortgage, similar kind of vein to what was going on in the United States. So what happened was in very similar vein to um, where Americans talk about white flight, a similar process happened in London, but where Americans talk about fleeing from race in white flight from people of colour, the residents of Barnsbury fled from the working classes. And this is where you get this class-based dimension that's in the definition of gentrification. So for example, Jonathan Raban, commentator in the, in the early 70s said, a combination of class fear and railway engineering turned a vast stretch of residential London into a no man's land. Camden Town, Holloway, Islington, all in inner London, were abandoned to the hopelessly entrenched working classes. Because of course the railway and particularly the development of the tube line meant that people were able to get out to the suburbs but commute back into the city easily. So the properties that had been left behind rapidly went into multi-occupation. In Barnsbury, there was a large stock of privately rented accommodation. Most of it of course is located minutes from central London. Statistically, Barnsbury was one of the areas of greatest housing stress in London. And just to give you a flavour of this, for example, in 1961, the vast majority of people living in Barnsbury lived in shared accommodation. Most of them had no access to a bath. Uh, most shared a toilet and all of them were living in overcrowded conditions. So it's what we would you know, call slum conditions, inner city slum conditions. So it's actually quite a strange environment for pioneer gentrifiers to want to move into. Pioneer gentrifiers began to move into Barnsbury in the late 1950s. However, it was extremely difficult to obtain funds during the 1950s and 60s to buy a property because most of inner London had been redlined by banks and uh, mortgage and, and building societies, seen to be too risky. They would fund you to buy a mortgage to move to the suburbs, but not to the inner city. So house purchases at this time in the very early days of pioneer gentrification were usually by cash, so there were cash buyers, or it was through some kind of personal connection. The guy up at the top right was one example of one of these early uh, pioneer gentrifiers. His name was Harley Sherlock. He was an architect. And what he did is he bought these two houses in this image here for cash with friends in Canonbury, which is adjacent to Barnsbury. And what he did is he set up 
basically an architectural practice, but he also lived there as well. So you get this very early kind of sense of these kind of live work units as well. And part of his architectural practice was about promoting the inner city and gentrification as a good thing. So, for example, he wrote a book called Cities Are Good For Us, where he kind of, you know, discussed the kind of what he considered to be the kind of positive experience of living in the diverse kind of inner city with access to locality and public transit etc but the main influx of uh, pioneer gentrifiers really happened between about 1961 and 1975 for example the increase in professional managerial increased from 23 to 43 percent and the kinds of uh, occupations of these pioneer gentrifiers tended to be things like um, university lecturers urban planners like you guys, architects, public sector workers like police officers, uh, school teachers, social workers, that kind of thing. So a very kind of particular set of people. And one thing that held them together, they were overwhelmingly left wing. They voted for the Labour Party. So as one of the pioneer gentrifiers, a graphic designer who moved in at the time said, I like the place because it's such a lack of the products of public schools, my man and all that, people aren't as affected as they are in Chelsea, Hampstead or South Kensington. Now, what that means to people in London is that these gentrifiers were trying to set themselves aside as somebody quite different in terms of middle class identity from the traditional upper middle class enclaves in London. So they were kind of setting themselves aside identity wise. I'm in trouble today. It's not moving my slides on. So if I do it that way, I'm having to do it by clicking. OK, so building societies then obviously kind of recognising that there was some kind of change going on and there was interest in moving into these areas began to take an interest themselves really after about 1972, when increasing numbers of the middle classes had kind of moved into the area. And they did things like they would go and visit uh, architects rehabilitated houses to see what their, the, the loans that they'd already handed out had achieved. And because they were impressed by what the gentrifiers had done, it meant that they began gradually to green line these neighbourhoods and it became increasingly easy to get mortgages. The result of this then was a rapid tenorial transformation between 1961 and 1981 in particular in that 20 year period. Owner occupation increased from 7% to 19%. Furnished rentals declined from 14 to 7, and the bulk of the uh, tenure, which had been unfurnished rentals, actually declined from 61% right down to 6.8%. So this became known as the flat breakup market. In other words, these properties would get either bought or sold onto a developer. They'd been in multiple occupation as flats. And they would they would go back to their original use as a single family unit. So they went from being flatted to being uh, how uh, being a single family home or a modernized house. Now, there's lots of kind of policy and urban planning stuff that kind of uh, acts as a context as to why some of this stuff happened. So one of the turning points was 1957, the Rent Act um, in terms of gentrification, because it gave uh, it, well, it allowed legally to give most rent control tenants six months to quit. So whereas in New York, you've still got semblances of rent control. In London, rent control got dismantled much earlier. Uh, and landlords, of course, if they could get rid of their tenants, could increase the rent or they could sell the property on. Tenants were forced to leave due to bribery and harassment. And in the picture here, I've got an example of one that became quite symbolic of this. So this is Stonefield Street in the centre of Barnsbury. And the property on the end there, when the tenants were out at work, the landlord actually got in builders to knock away the entire side of the house. So when they got back from work, they found that their bed and their property was basically all kind of facing the street. And this is the kind of quite vicious activity that became known as Rackmanism after the unscrupulous landlord Peter Rackman, which was about kind of intimidation. In this particular property, um, they actually uh, had put a kind of steel pillar in the center of the room right through one of the tenants beds and they wrote on it, um, you dirty, filthy bastard. So it got quite bad. I mean, there was even examples of guns being pulled on people, which you don't expect in London, but really quite severe uh, kind of harassment and winkling to get people out. 
So this in many ways became a symbol and there was a kind of fight back against this through the local uh, kind of legal uh, centre and ended up getting rebuilt, etc. Another act that was really important was the uh, 1969 Housing Act. And what this did is it gave government a new uh, commitment to rehabilitation instead of urban renewal. So where there'd been obviously lots of post-war slum clearance and urban renewal, like in New York, then government backed off from that a little bit and started to think about rehabilitation and renovating existing properties. And what this act did is it provided local authorities with the power to allocate discretionary improvement grants to properties. And these were about 1,000 or 1,200 pounds for conversions from flatted or multiple occupation to houses. The proviso was that these grants had to be met pound for pound by the improver or the developer. So of course they automatically um, favored the more kind of better off person, i.e. the pioneer gentrifier or a developer who had money to be able to do that. And it really kind of kicked off gentrification in Barnsbury. So by 1972, nearly 60% of Barnsbury's housing had been rehabilitated, that is gentrified. And the new households were mostly uh, middle-class owner occupiers. And then we see that uh, house prices rose significantly. So for example, in one of the classic kind of Gothic squares in the center of Barnsbury, Lonsdale Square, in 1966, you could buy a property for about 9,000 pounds. By 1972, so only six years later, it was £35,000. So a fourfold kind of increase in property prices. So really significant. So you can see very clearly here that classic gentrification that Ruth Glass was talking about. Of course, behind all this, there was lots of different kind of work going on. So, for example, um, pioneer gentrification itself was very much part and parcel of the promotion of the kind of urban conservation and preservation movements in London. Pioneer gentrifiers were heavily involved in that. So one of the associations that developed was called the Barnsbury Association, led by Ken Pring, who was a uh, architect, but he was also a key pioneer gentrifier in Barnsbury. The whole idea was about preserving and enhancing the 19th century townscape think, and making arguments as to why it was unique. So a bit like the brownstoning movement, I guess, in New York City. And of course, many of these people were well educated, had contacts in Fleet Street, they had contacts in Whitehall, and they were able to get their ideas and their approach eventually accepted as official planning policy. So Barnsbury became a conservation area, ultimately. And there's been lots written on this. So, for example, Peter Hall, the uh, uh, big kind of big guy urban planner, so Peter Hall said, you know, that, that they became the kind of pundits, the kind of heroes of planning in terms of how to improve a twilight area in terms of rehabilitation. If you look down the bottom here, Ken Pring himself became known as the man who saved Islington, because, of course, by doing this, what they did is they stopped uh, for example, the motorway and a bit like, you know, highway development in the US, there was a motorway that was going to come right through inner London and rip through the heart of Barnsbury, demolish all of this property. And none of that gentrification would have happened if these guys hadn't kind of stood up and kind of fought back, um, you know, to kind of stop the demolition of historically interesting buildings. Outside of that, so obviously what we get then is a physical change and a social change. Um, so during the late 60s and early 70s, that's when gentrification was at its most active and most visible. And certainly this quotation here demonstrates the kind of visibility of it on the ground. So it says, um, one of the tips of that whole iceberg of social pressures, which is London, is to be found in the Barnsbury district of Islington. Uh, and it talks about the visibility, the outward appearance of gentrification side by side with buildings that had not been gentrified. So you've got these kind of houses that are grey and full of poverty and multiple, uh, multiple occupation next to those that are repainted and showing wealth. And that you could see this kind of all throughout the neighbourhood and that people would find themselves kind of divided into camps, the gentrifiers and the non-gentrifiers. So we get a, a real sense of the kind of uh, social change as well. And the fact that it was very cheek by jowl, particularly at that time. Of course, one of the exemplars of this class difference was space. So obviously, if you're in a multiple occupied uh, building, space is tight as opposed to a single uh, family dwelling. So one gentrifier remembers in 1977, four houses in Lonsdale Square 
Two of them contained single family middle class owner occupants, while the others, the other two provided accommodation for 48 single working class tenants in the furnished rented sector. So when we're talking about multiple occupation, we're talking about severe overcrowding. And as the quote says here, many of the working class resented the influx of these Chelseaites, as they called them, middle class immigrants with totally different lifestyles and value orientations, and conflicts began to emerge. In fact, these pioneer gentrifiers began to be kind of uh, mocked in uh, cartoon strips, and this is one from the Times newspaper. And you can see here it kind of mocks their kind of left liberal countercultural sensibilities. The first one says, not to worry, Daddy and I think spelling is elitist because there, there was a, a you know almost a kind of anti-educational kickback as well for many of these people. And the other one says, Simon, which of the, these two dresses would you say was the more left of center? So you know, kind of taking a, a pit, the kind of piss out of their middle class sensibility, but their left wing identity. And the last one here says, I read this very sound Tory manifesto, but it appears to be put out by the Labour Party. So this is quite interesting because it's very indicative of this transition from old Labour to new Labour that was led by gentrifiers in many of these inner London neighbourhoods. So that's politically quite a, a, an interesting one. So one of the key issues around gentrification, obviously, when the process is happening in a neighbourhood is social mixing. Pioneer gentrifiers wanted to socially mix. They were pro-diversity. But what was actually the reality of that on the ground? And here's two nice examples, I think. So Ken Pring, the same pioneer gentrifier I just talked about in Barnsbury, he said, the present trend towards a rising proportion of the middle classes and the population will continue. This will help create a better social balance, a better structure of community and the professional expertise of those guys will ultimately benefit the underprivileged population. So there was quite an arrogant sense that this middle class kind of social capital will trickle down to the poor. And of course, we can see that in policy later. Other people, other gentrifiers, however, were much more negative about actually how they wanted to mix and really if they really did want to mix. So this one said, um, this was one that was interviewed, said, I like to smile at them and stop for a talk. In other words, the working class occupants, but I don't really want anything to do with them. I don't quite understand I don't think they quite understand why we want to pay so much money for these houses and go to so much trouble to live in these houses. In other words, the, the trouble of gentrifying, which they don't like very much, because, of course, most of the working class population still aspired to move out to the suburbs because that was the kind of not the American dream, but that was the London dream. So that was kind of pioneer gentrification, uh, classic or first wave gentrification. So what happened in the uh, 1980s was a second wave of gentrification. And this was much more corporate in nature, in nature. So most of Barnsbury had been gentrified. But what happened is there was less pioneer gentrifiers doing the gentrifying. It was much more development led by developers. The people who were moving in were much more wealthy. They were less likely to be public sector workers like police officers or social workers. They were more likely to work in banking or management or, you know, kind of uh, that kind of uh, set of occupations. So in other words, kind of business types or corporate types. And it equates in, in many ways with uh, the geographer David Lay's kind of uh, notion from hippie to yuppie. So the kind of countercultural first wave gentrifier eventually gets replaced by the young urban professional in this second and third wave of gentrification. So certainly these corporate or second wave gentrifiers were less countercultural, although they were still left wing their left-wing politics were more centrist, and this is what led ultimately to the de development of new Labour. In other words, kind of Tony Blair, who came to power in 1997, and indeed Tony Blair actually lived in Barnsbury. Um, behind the scenes, there was lots of kind of increases in public-private partnerships as part of the development. So for example, the local council uh, twinning up with developers to develop housing, et cetera. And in the case of the, the picture on the right here, the old agricultural hall, became redeveloped as a business design centre. And in many ways, it was kind of symbolic of this kind of new corporate takeover in this second wave. Now, alongside that corporate second wave, we also had the arrival of loft living in Islington and in London as well, particularly in places like Clerkenwell. And partly um, this was due to the fact that um, a change of law allowed conversion from uh, 
kind of old manufacturing buildings or um, fact, uh, warehouses, stuff like that to residential. And this, this conversion really triggered this kind of loft living process. So it started later, I think, in London than it did in New York City because it was kind of blocked by zoning and that kind of legislation. But of course, this kind of uh, living is very different to the kind of uh, gentrification in Barnsbury. It's much more about preserving the industrial past as opposed to a kind of residential past. So it's quite a different flavor in terms of its architecture um, but of course, the Manhattan Loft Company and all these other kind of companies moved in, and now it's a, a quite a big deal. Meanwhile, um, a third wave of gentrification begun to hit Barnsbury. Um, this is a process that I've talked about in Brooklyn and New York City, but here it is also happening in Barnsbury. Um, that's super gentrification. So, in the I guess from about the mid 1990s, Barnsbury began to re gentrify. So people felt, oh, Barnsley had gentrified, end of. But in fact, it wasn't the end of it. It began to re-gentrify. And in fact, it began to super gentrify. So a new super wealthy group of professionals began to move in, uh, buy up properties, even from pioneer gentrifiers who then, you know, sold on and moved out. Very different people, elite forms of education, many of them public school educated. By public, we mean private school in the UK. Uh, many of them have been to Oxbridge. So a very different kind of people. They enjoyed very large salaries. Many of them had uh, really big bonuses so they could come and be cash buyers. Many of them didn't even need mortgages. And they were less interested in sending their children, for example, to the local schools. They would send their children to private schools, etc. So quite a different kind of vibe. So I won't go into that in big detail. Now, more recently, we have a, a newer process in Islington, and this is Archway Tower, which is literally a five minute walk from my house where I'm sitting right as we speak. So this is probably one of the more recent mutations of gentrification in Islington. It's private rental gentrification. So Archway Tower is a big tower that became infamous in the 1980s as the kind of uh, social security office for North London. It became really famous in old punk songs who were kind of fighting against the kind of economic decline due to Thatcherism and unemployment and stuff like that. So a company came in called Essential Living. They bought up um, the building, they clad it, uh, they completely refurbished it throughout. So these are really high end furbished rental apartments. There's a roof garden, there's a pizza oven on the roof, there's a movie theatre, there's a gym, all the kind of things you expect now and charging very high rents. And they came in saying, actually, that uh, we are bringing rental gentrification from New York City to London. And this is our first test case is what they actually said on their promo. So it's kind of interesting. Anyway, so of course, the whole mantra is gentrification is great for everybody. It's marketed as this process of positive class change, but obviously it doesn't because there's this false proposition that somehow the social capital of the wealthy will filter down to the poor and the less educated. And of course, this was very much kind of part of mixed communities policy, which developed, which I'll talk very briefly about in a minute. But certainly London at the moment is now perhaps what we might call hyper gentrified. So like San Francisco, like Vancouver in Canada, extremely high land value, speculation, money laundering, overseas buyers and investment. Of course, whether COVID or Brexit impacts this, we don't know yet. One of the last bricks in the wall has been public housing. So council estates, as we call it, or what you guys call public housing projects. And these are the things that I've been working on recently because they've been under attack. Lots of councils are handing over public housing to private developers, particularly international private developers. So what's happening now in London is different kinds of gentrification are kind of happening at the same time. And you still have pioneer gentrifiers, but obviously way fewer of them. But what's happening now is it's predominantly the state that's involved. And one of their um, ways of doing this is that they've been uh, promoting new build gentrification. So, for example, along the Thames, they uh, kind of uh, zoned for what they call blue ribbon development along the Thames. And this is the Montevitro building that uh, Sir Norman Foster um, designed in Battersea, right on the River Thames. And you can see that I actually managed to get inside this building before it went on the market. And you can see the photo I took out from the inside of the bedroom of this unit outside. Those are the kind of public housing projects that are literally 10 metres away from your from your window. So you can see the kind of extremes of wealth and poverty juxtaposed. This this uh, new development was gated. 
so they don't share a space. So although there's no direct displacement because this is built on brownfield land, there's indirect displacement because those gentrification pressures are pushing into those adjacent communities and, and neighborhoods. Now, one of the things that's kind of helped the gentrification of public housing, which is really one of the big things that's happening at the moment, is mixed communities policy. Um, this was very much a policy that came out of, of New Labour. It was seen as a kind of gentrifier's charter in many ways. And you can see this correlation between Barnsbury pioneer gentrifiers and how it bled into uh, New Labour policy. Now, of course, mixed communities policy is very much the kind of trickle down economics that if wealthier people are moved into a poor, deprived neighbourhood, somehow it will help you know, elevate their standards of education. Uh, it might help them get a job. It might give them new networks, that kind of stuff. You guys are all very familiar with this because we very simply copied off your HOPE 6 programme. Um, so basically we copied this, not identically, but near enough. And of course, I'm not going to go through this because that's, that's your remit. You all know all about that. But I'll give you an example of, of, of something that became a symbol of this in London. So the Haygate estate is a very large count or was a very large council estate in Southwark in inner London. Uh, it's a stone's throw from Westminster. The Haygate estate was a large public housing project, as you guys call it, had 3000 uh, tenants. All of these people were displaced. Uh, it was demolished. The very last person to be forcibly removed was actually a high school teacher who had bought his three bedroom apartment through the right, the government's right to buy scheme where you could buy, unlike in the US, you can buy public housing here. Thatcher's right to buy program, some of you might be familiar with. Um, so people who weren't renting as council tenants had to be bought out by the local council, but they only offered him a quarter of what it would have cost him to buy another similar property nearby. So he kind of stood his ground and refused to leave. And eventually he was actually evicted uh, by a whole pile of security guards, bizarrely. And there was a whole hoo-ha about this. Um, the work that I did with some of the uh, local activists in the area looked at trying to map where uh, people ended up going, where these 3,000 people who'd been displaced went to. And you can see here there's two figures. One is for the council tenants who are paying council rent. And you can see that they're displaced from the estate, but they're kind of displaced all over South London. Whereas in figure two, we actually look at the leaseholders who actually owned their properties and they get displaced mostly out of London altogether because they could not afford to buy anything even vaguely similar in London. Whereas the council tenants in figure one either got rehoused somewhere else, else kind of in the kind of fringes of the borough or out of the borough. Okay, so I can talk, I can ask questions, uh, answer questions about that uh, more later. Of course, the impacts of this are quite clear. Social impacts, destruction of social networks and family support that are in low income communities. Economics of the leaseholders lost the investment in their property. They lost their savings, many of them, because they had to spend their savings in buying another property. Many people lost their jobs because they had to move out and it was too far to commute. There were cultural impacts, community support networks were broken, churches were shut down, loss of sense of place, health impacts, mental and physical health impacts. There were lots of examples of depression. There are at least three cases of suicide that I know of, of people who'd been displaced. Schooling, so kids had to move, either had to move from the school they were in or they had to travel long distances back to stay at the same school, which of course impacted education. So really quite negative, severe impacts for this particular community. And this is what it was replaced with. So that's the estate on the left there. So quite a large public housing estate, 3000 people, structurally sound, beautiful, mature trees and gardens, completely demolished. And it was rebuilt as Elephant Park. And the entire thing was sold off plan in East Asia. So we can see quite clearly that this became a symbol for state-led gentrification in London and the negative impacts of it. And if you look at this diagram from a uh, campaign group called Concrete Action, you can see the scale of this state-led, what they call regeneration, but actually is gentrification schemes across London now. So you can see that, you know, any vestige of public housing is now under attack. And that's kind of where we're at at the moment. And once it's dismantled, it's gone forever. And that means that London is completely or inner London, certainly completely gentrified. So that's the, uh, the, the kind of case of that. But then there's also other 
di slightly different but similar things going on. So some of these mega redevelopment projects like the redevelopment of the Olympic site is obviously been a form of mega gentrification due to displacement, not just residential displacement, but also commercial displacement of businesses. And, you know, there's all sorts of things going on there. And some universities, particularly, for example, University College London is heavily involved in this. And there's been big kickback even from their own faculty. One of the other big ones that got blocked was known as the Haringey Development Vehicle. Here, the, the London the Inner London Borough of Haringey was literally going to hand over all of its public housing and all of its public land to Lendlease, which is an Australian uh, international multinational property developer. Luckily, there was a whole public protest and kickback, and that got stopped. But there's still pressure for some of this to happen, so it's still ongoing. So the day-to-day -day reality, of course, is in the midst of all this, many people in these communities are living in this kind of weird phenomenological kind of state of, of weirdness, whereby, you know, rich and poor people are living cheap by jowl. So here we have, you know, really expensive kind of yuppie shops, champagne and fromage in Brixton Market. And here we have the traditional Caribbean kind of uh, fruit and vegetables that the, the market traditionally had sold. Two very different clientels. There was all the, also a whole saga last year about how many of these new developments that had allowed some measure of social tenants in them had rich doors and poor doors. The poor doors were at the back of the developments and uh, the less wealthy people had to go in through back alleys so they couldn't be seen. And the big tower here, Strata Tower, which is an elephant castle, the bottom 10 floors of this building were held for social housing tenants from the Haygate Estate via a housing association they have a separate lift from all the other floors, which has all the private housing. So despite being premised on social mixing and mixed communities, ironically, they don't do that at all when it comes to the actual design of the buildings and, and the kind of neighbourhoods. So I'm just going to finish briefly then saying, well, OK, you know, my work's been heavily on London because that's where I live. But also in the last five to eight years, I've been working on this process globally. And I want to just say quite clearly that the gentrification was global, even when Ruth Glass was talking about gentrification. I think there, there were lots of examples outside of London, obviously, um, and it is global. So just to give you an example, if we go back in time historically, we can now claim that gentrification, for example, housemanization is an example of gentrification. So the large scale redevelopment of whole swathes of central Paris in the late 1800s that slum cleared in order to build high-end middle-class housing units and large kind of boulevards was very much an example of gentrification. This would not have been an example of gentrification that Ruth Glass necessarily thought of at that time as gentrification. But as the process has mutated, we can now certainly think back on this and think about are there historical examples of gentrification back in time that we can look at. But bringing us forward to thinking about it as the kind of global kind of epicenter at the moment around kind of neoliberal urban policy, certainly one of the reasons that gentrification has taken off globally has been the ascendancy of the secondary circuit of real estate. So just to give you a quotation here out of my plan for gentrification book uh, written with uh, Hun and Ernesto, residents of, say, uh, Lagos, Jakarta or Istanbul may reasonably expect that in cities of such size, They'll be able to find a buyer for an apartment in the future while producing commodities for consumption or export is perceived as risky. In other words, real estate, investing in real estate is now seen to be less risky than investing in manufacturing or industry or stuff like that. And that's one of the reasons that gentrification has really taken off globally in the 2000s. However, even though Neil Smith said in 2002, gentrification has gone global. In fact, gentrification had been global before that. And again, you know, we need to be very wary of these statements by people at certain periods of time. So, for example, in our book, we talk about uh, the redevelopment programmes in Seoul in South Korea in the 1980s, which uh, demolished large swathes of uh, central Seoul and redeveloped into kind of middle income housing with massive kind of evictions of low income people very much an example of, of gentrification, but attached to a sense of modernization and progress, so sold to people through this idea of modernization and progress. But the evictions that happened were brutal, and there were big riots against these evictions at the time, and people have forgotten about all this, I think, or, or it just doesn't register as gentrification. <laughs> 
So what's happening at the moment then, there's, there's kind of different takes on this. So in the global south, reinvestment in the secondary circuit of capital is, is happening in slightly different ways. So for example, in China, you've got reinvestment in the secondary circuit happening at the same time as in the primary circuit. So you've got real estate and industrial production being invested in at the same time as part of its modernization programs. Whereas in other places like Dubai, it's all about the secondary circuit. It's about real estate. OK, so um, Dubai, then, of course, we have what they call this kind of spectacular kind of urbanization. And it is linked in many ways to uh, these kind of different circuits of, of, of kind of what's perceived to be the place where you can make most money and profit. I think China's a, a really, really interesting case, because in China, the transition to a market economy uh, has also been twinned with a, a real push to grow an urban middle class because that urban middle class then become the consumers for this new market economy. So getting rid of the kind of crappy housing in the centre of Chinese cities, redeveloping it as middle income, modernised as, as a progressive housing as the kind of thing goes, has become quite critical as part of the modernisation agenda in China. And obviously there's been large scale displacements. Many of the people who've been displaced have been pushed to the fringes of uh, many of these uh, big Chinese cities like Shanghai, Beijing and places like that. So the displacements in the way that the gentrifications have been quite mega, the displacements have been quite mega as well. Um, and just quickly, just to give you some other flavours from around the world. So these mega projects have really taken off. This is Eco Atlantic, which we talk about in our plunge gentrification book in Lagos in Nigeria. This is reclaiming uh, whole parts of the, the kind of coastline around uh, uh, Lagos to develop it as a new kind of what they're calling a new kind of mega district and again it's about their kind of global city aspiration it's about modernization and Bill Clinton's inauguration comments I think kind of sum up the insanity of this he said um, Eco Atlantic will work to improve the economy of Nigeria all over the world it will bring enormous opportunities I'm convinced that within five years people will be coming from all over the world to see this so you can see massive inflated aspirations. Of course, what happened were lots and lots of people displaced, particularly uh, slum dwellers along the lagoon there. There were 40,000 people displaced here. So serious, serious kind of displacement going on in what's essentially gentrification. I'm just going to touch on two other things before finishing off. Of course, we can now talk about slum gentrification. This is a, is a term that I think is beginning to be bandied around much more. So certainly I can talk probably about the state-led gentrification of council estates in London as an example of slum gentrification, because the councils argue these are slums and therefore we need to get rid of them. But in the same way, there's been slum gentrification uh, processes in Brazil. So, you know, Villa Autodromo next to the Olympic site, the, the favela that really got kind of impacted by the Olympic Games and become quite infamous in many ways. This was a community of fishermen who lived on the edge of the pond. And when the 2016 Olympics was announced in Rio, it was home to about 450 families who were living in very good, well-built brick dwellings. Many of them worked locally. They were educated. These were sanitary. There were energy supplies. So not what we would normally think of as slum in many ways. Many of the residents were homeowners and they were constantly threatened with removal and pushed eventually and pushed more and more and more with lots of different arguments. Firstly, they were seen to be a threat to the safety of the Olympic athletes. Then they were seen, then they would argue there were kind of high level of pollution in the pond and they shouldn't be there. So lots of different ways that they were kind of pressurised and eventually the favela was demolished in 2016. And it's become quite symbolic of the impact of particularly the Olympic Games in terms of displacement. As well as that, in the run up to the Olympics, uh, Rio tried to kind of sanitise or kind of enact kind of zero tolerance policies like in New York City and favelas in Rio. Again, as an attempt to make it feel safer for people to go to the Olympics and to, to act as tourists around that. Part of this was about also developing a kind of favela uh, chic. So certainly when... Um, the uh, Rio police began to pacify the inner city slums and they inserted police pacification units in many of the, the favelas. Then murder rates went down and one of the organisations that represented a real estate in Rio estimated that within 72 hours after the police took some of these favelas, property prices jumped by 
So you can see, I mean, it's fairly strategic in many ways. So we ended up with luxury boutique hotels in the middle of favelas. You can now go and have your tourist favela experience. I mean, it's kind of gross, but it, it is what it is. And one last one before I conclude, because I think it's really interesting, is, is from India. Um, so this notion of bourgeois environmentalism, very much an example of gentrification in Indian cities. So the new middle classes, of course, in the global south are quite consumption orientated, but at the same time, many espouse green quality of life, livable city credentials, a bit like kind of pioneer gentrifiers did. But if we take, for example, Delhi's uh, bourgeois event, uh, bourgeois environmentalists, you know, they desired and they argued for and they lobbied for clean air and clean spaces. But of course, this lobbying became more important than lobbying for the conditions of slums in Delhi for you know, shelter and for employment for the poor. And of course, these kind of middle class discourses kind of worn out. So these Indian gentrifiers wanted ordered environments like the ones in the image here, safe, hygienic, unpolluted, green, uncongested, quality of life was important, they gated away from crime, disease, and from the other adjacent slum neighborhoods. So they had parks for morning walks, ashrams, temples. But of course, this kind of bourgeois environmentalism, or kind of greenwashing, you might want to call it, ignores basic concerns of the poor who were living cheap by jowl in terms of sanitation, water, and stuff like that. So yeah, so it's clear then, that cities like Mumbai, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Shanghai are now at the cutting edge of urban change. If we think about gentrification as this kind of neoliberal edge, active processes of gentrification in the USA and Europe are nothing in comparison, I think, to some of the mega gentrifications and mega displacements going on in cities in the global south. And down the bottom there, I've got, for example, in Istanbul, there's been massive relocation of slum populations in Istanbul, right out 40, 50 miles outside the city to the middle of nowhere. So I actually visited some of these sites and there's literally nothing. They build these properties, put them in, no schools, no health centers, no jobs. And ironically, many of these people have moved back and are actually homeless now living in the center of Istanbul. So really severe kind of negative impacts around gentrification. And I think what's really interesting is that UN Habitat has finally woken up to this. So in 2020, they actually finally said, cities must be preventing not just social segregation, but also gentrification and social apartheid. And of course, gentrification creates social segregation and social apartheid, even when it espouses social mixity or mixed communities policy. So I'm going to leave it there. If you've got any questions, that would be great. Thank you so much for, uh, for your talk, Dr. Elise. That was fascinating. Um, so I think we'll move on to the Q&A portion of the talk now. Um, so we have some questions teed up in the uh, chat, but anyone else who would like to ask a question, feel free to type in your question there. Uh, so our first question is from Stefan, who asked, um, you mentioned this briefly at the start of your talk, but can you elaborate on the conceptual epistemic links between gentrification, urban rural linkages, and planetary urbanization? In what ways are processes of operationalizing the hinterland connected to gentrification in the urban core? And how have these relationships changed across different waves of gentrification? Yeah, so an important question. So even if you go back to that Ruth Glass coinage of the term gentrification in that particular paragraph, when she's talking about gentrification, she's actually talking about a gentry as in gentrification, who are moving into these urban areas. But actually, their real aspiration in life, but they don't quite have enough money to do it, is for this kind of rural way of living. So what happens is that rural way of living is brought into the inner city. So if you think about um, the early days of Habitat, which was kind of the precursor to IKEA in, in London, you know, strip wood floors, uh, you know, uh, wood burning stoves, uh, you know, getting rid of wallpaper, stripping back to the basics. It was very much a rustic, rural notion of living that then became embedded in kind of gentrifier identity. So there's always been a relationship between urban and rural in gentrification from the very beginning. But I think what's happened more recently is that as inner cities have, uh, have kind of gentrified, not only is that gentrification then bled obviously into inner suburban areas, and you see this in New York and Queens and places like that, but it's even gone beyond that now. I think it, it, it's kind of bled into 
the outer suburbs, so certainly in London now, there are outer suburban areas that are densifying through processes of gentrification, the building of apartment units and stuff like that that weren't there before. It's no longer kind of a low density environment. It's building up and it brings with it that kind of urban loft living style kind of gentrifier kind of aesthetic. And then, of course, you have, um, you know, the fact that you know, at the end of the day, we're all urban now. If you think about uh, social media, technology, internet, you know, even if you live in a rural area, you're not, it's not like in the 1940s where if you lived in a rural area, you didn't really have much sense of the urban in the same way unless you'd physically been there. You know, now, even if you're living in an urban area and, and your education, and everything else, you're kind of urban. We're all urban beings, certainly in the global north now. So I think, you know, thinking about that in terms of gentrification is really important. So, you know, when people are moving to rural areas now, they take that urban sensibility with them as well and they try to recreate it in urban areas. So now I think there's actually more of a correlation with that literature on rural and wilderness gentrification than there was even 10 years ago. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Ranjani, who said, uh, it is interesting that gentrification seems to parallel political shifts in the Labour Party. Do you see the rise of Blairites and generally the more neoliberal turn of labour stemming from these spatial processes? Yeah, and I mean, actually, that's something that eventually I'm going to be doing a project on. So I'm really interested in how, as a geographer, you know, our main interest is place and space and spatiality. So how did how did these places, these gentrifying neighbourhoods grow? these kind of political value systems. So I'm really interesting, interested in that kind of context. So for example, many of the early members of the new Labour kind of clique, in inverted commas, they all lived near to each other in uh, kind of Highbury, Barnsbury and uh, Canonbury, which were all in Islington. They used to play football together. They even had a soccer, as you guys call it. They had a football team called Demon Eyes, which is a bizarre name, but anyway. So all these discussions about politics and mixity and diversity were kind of happening in these very localised ways. So I think it's very interesting how gentrification in its early days in Islington was about locality and the value of locality and the value of public spaces. So I'm kind of interested in how it helped create the discussions that help create the kind of value systems that went into new labor and particularly the urban policy that new labor took forward which many people have critiqued as a kind of gentrifier's charter don't know that's a bit warbly but anyway <laughs> uh, our next question comes from uh joe who said uh here in the u.s there is an emerging emb movement that argues that the solution to gentrification is to massively increase it the housing supply. It seems from your talk that UK slash US housing policy happens in tandem. So curious whether that's the same movement or perhaps a similar policy move towards supply side solutions has happened in London. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the big key, key questions. So most government people would argue that the uh, answer to the housing crisis is supply is to build, 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 build more houses. But most activists on the ground would argue that that's a myth, that actually there's plenty of property on the ground. The problem is that property is in the wrong hands. So it's either being handed to international uh, investors and it's just ghost property. So it's sitting there with nobody living in it or um you know, different, like, for example, different kinds of, of, of kind of uh, private rent sector that aren't being opened to a kind of wider set of consumers, etc. So there's lots of kind of pushback now, particularly from activists and also arguing that, you know, if if we need to increase supply to deal with gentrification, then why are you demolishing council estates, for example? It kind of it goes against the very sensibility of that. That's the kind of the conversations that are going on at the moment. But unfortunately, governments are attached to supply because that's where the money's made. Uh, Carolyn at, or said, uh, I'm curious what role you would say race plays in gentrification in London and how you would compare it to the US. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important question. And a lot of the work that I've been doing on the demolition of council estates has been looking at race and ethnicity, because many of the people that have been displaced are not not all of them, but large numbers of them are non-white. But that the kind of structures of racism and racial disadvantage in London are very different to what they are in uh, not in 
the United States. And I think one of the problems we have at the moment in the UK is that many social scientists draw on American literature on this. And certainly, um, even in London, many of the kind of localist activist groups, particularly uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean groups, for example, in Brixton in South London, you know, they're using kind of American rhetoric and kind of Spike Lee stuff to kind of fight back. But actually, the problem is in London, it's much more comp. It's, it's a very different kind of structure of racism and it's much more hidden. And I think what's become very interesting just over the summer is that people are beginning to pull it apart and to show it, show it for what it is between Windrush, you know, and, and the kind of Im impact of Windrush between Black Lives Matter activities here, you know, the toppling of kind of slave owner statues and stuff like that. So we're actually in a process of change at the moment in trying to conceptualise in the UK and in London, you know, what, how can we theorise and conceptualise these structures of racism and it, in my case, relate it to processes of gentrification in a totally different way to how it's been done in the US. So it's early days here, it, it, it's kind of emerging work. Uh, it's a much more mixed, racially, London's much more mixed or ethnically much more mixed than even New York is. So it's quite complex. So on a big public housing project, it's not going to be predominantly black. It might have Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Somalian, Afro-Caribbean, Nigerian. It might have, you know, all sorts of people. So it, it is more complex. Uh, let's see, our next question comes from Jur, who said, thank you for this fantastic talk. Uh, how would you comment on the recent phenomena that happened during COVID when the wealthy population in Lo of London started to move to the countryside and the prices still haven't gone down? How does that affect the urban areas, but also the rural ones in the UK? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the newspapers, including the American newspapers have really played up this kind of, you know, everybody's leaving the city, the city's too scary, it's too dense, you're going to pick up COVID, anybody who's got money is going to move to the Hamptons, or in our case, move to Burke Hampstead from London. The reality of that is that, that many people who had second homes went to their second homes, they still retained their property in London. So I don't think there's been an exodus in that sense. Um, However, there is a big question now in the kind of, po and in fact, I've just written something with Derek Hira, who works at American University in Washington, D.C., where we've been trying to think through what might be the impacts of the post-COVID city beyond gentrification. So people like Richard Florida are coming out and saying, oh, no, gentrification is, you know, the city's still great, creativity will still be there. But actually, I think it's more complex than that. I think people's relationship with the city is changing due to COVID, and I think it was changing anyway. Um, and work practices and other stuff are changing. So, you know, why would you spend, you know, £500,000 on a loft unit in Clerkenwell if you could buy, you know, four bedroom house somewhere else and you're still having to work from home? So I think it's up in the air, but I, I do think it's overplayed at the moment. This idea that everybody's suddenly leaving the inner city, I think is a bit overplayed in the media. Uh, our next question is from Wen Fei, who said, you mentioned that gentrification is now state-led, but I wonder if you can speak to the role of government involvement throughout the different periods of gentrification. It's my understanding that even the first wave gentrifiers were partially motivated by favorable credit incentives, like renovation mm -hmm. loans and the like. Yeah, so I think I talked about that and I think I'm hoping that came through. So I talked about the various housing acts and I talked about the home improvement grants in the early seventies that led to the kind of escalation of, of gentrification in uh, Barnsbury. The state, the state has always been there floating in the background, but what's happened is that over time, the state has become a more powerful actor and they've, they've really latched on to this notion of gentrification and they've begun to push it forward, particularly in terms of urban policy and social policy. And really at the moment, it seems to be the kind of key thing that's been put on the table for most cities, certainly in the UK, that gentrification is the way forward. It's like there's nothing else on the table, which is quite bizarre. And I think it's our job as people who are kind of fighting these processes to try and get some alternatives on the table. Uh, thank you. Our next question is from Valerie, who said, uh, thanks for a great talk, Dr. Lees. I'm wondering if you see a state-led counter solution to gentrification-induced displacement. For instance, progressive electeds are promoting a Green New Deal for public housing here in the states. Or do you see solutions as being more rooted outside of the state, like community land trusts, resident-led 
or resident-led cooperative in conversions. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because that's that's the big debate here at the moment is between people who think we stay away from the state and the kickback needs to come back from community land trusts or cooperatives or stuff like that. Or people like me that actually say, well, the state needs to stand up and be accountable here and actually done, do something about this. And actually, I think we need both. So what's really interesting, ironically, is today the, the Labour Party, who is. I mean, on the new leader of the Labour Party now is a bit more new Labour, obviously, than Jeremy Corbyn, who didn't get through. But uh, they released a paper just today that does many of the things that you're talking about in the United States, kind of talking about this kind of Green Deal, uh, that we should be refurbishing council estates instead of dem being demolished. And that was just released today. And what's really interesting to me is that, you know, the irony, of course, is many of these Labour led boroughs were the ones who are the most gung ho about gentrifying. So in a way, they need to stand up and actually apologise first for what they've done before they take it forward. So politically, it's all a bit strange. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat box. So I think maybe I'll ask um, one question that I had, which was, um, so earlier you mentioned that ghost properties and absentee ownership have become sort of predominant trends in gentrifying cities. Do you have any policy recommendations on sort of how to push back on these trends where we see absentee ownership really starting to kind of overtake some cities? Yeah, I mean, it's beginning. So, for example, um, due to lots of lobbying from housing activists and, and other people across London. So the mayor of London has now said that in, in new developments, it, it should be first uh, the first offer for a property has to be somebody who's from London or from the UK. Uh, and, you know, other cities have done that, Vancouver and places in Berlin and places like that are starting to play with these different ideas. However, you know, that that was, you know, 12 months ago. I think we're in a different context now. I think certainly for London, Brexit and, co and COVID is going to have a massive impact. And I think we're going to be in a different city. You know, you guys are just dealing with COVID, which is pretty damn big. But Brexit is a whole different ballgame, you know, because are people going to feel confident investing? I don't know. Nobody really knows. Are people going to withdraw investment? And if they do, what will that mean for the property market? You know, we've already had the impact also of Airbnbs flooding the market because they couldn't rent them out as Airbnb. They've all been put up for regular private rentals. So now what's happened in London is that rents, private rents in London have gone down. And it's the only city in the UK where private rents have actually gone down this year. Every other city in the UK, they've gone up. And that's purely because Airbnb has just flooded the market. So there's lots of stuff going on. There's lots of weird little kind of things that I think make all of this quite questionable in terms of, of, of where we're going to be in five years from now, certainly in London anyway. I bet. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat box. Um, so if anyone would like to ask an additional question, uh, now would be the time. Um, okay, uh, so it looks like we'll maybe end a little bit early this afternoon, um, but Dr. Lee, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to present today. Um, on thank behalf of GSAP and the Urban Planning Program, um, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Great, okay. Well, enjoy your day then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>